Hello, I'm Jeremy Fry. I am the senior pastor here at Advent Lutheran Church. I want to thank you for taking the time to participate in the following worship recording. Our mission here at Advent is to be the followers of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world. For us, that means connecting people to God and connecting people to people. We serve and love our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we go out and we serve and love each other with the same love that God has for us. Everyone who walks through the doors of Advent and participates with us needs to know that they are a child of God, wonderfully and beautifully made in God's image. No matter your race, your gender, your sexual orientation or identity, your social economical status, no matter where you, where you come from and who you are, you are loved by God and you are welcome to come and participate in worship and leadership in any of our ministries. Our ministries happen because of the generosity of our people. If you would like any more information about the ministries here at Advent Lutheran Church, how you would like to get involved, or information on how to give to these ministries, please visit our website, adventbrevard.org. Thank you, and God bless. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for all these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I'm he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. King Herod the Great, who was in power when Jesus was born, was a nut job. <laughs> Let's just call a spade a spade. And the guy was crazy. Uh, he was so paranoid. Now, that's kind of what he was known for. The saying went that you were safer being a pig in Herod's household than a son. He was so jealous and paranoid about everything. And we know of all the terrible things he did to the innocents after Jesus was born. We, we kind of know him as this crazy, mad king. But uh, one of the things I was reminded of as I was looking at our text for today um, is that one of the things that isn't discussed much is that he was also a magnificent builder and architect. Um, in fact, in his day, 
uh, many of the wonders of the world were his accomplishments. He built fabulous structures. And probably the most impressive uh, that is in our text for today is the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, this is a, did you know they had cameras back then? <laughs> it's incredible. Now, this is actually a, a model of the temple in Jesus' day, a scale model, as, if, as it would look if you could have had a camera back then looking from the Kidron Valley across to the temple. Uh, and this was Herod's temple. Uh, it had been suffering from desecration and neglect for generations because of all the foreign rulers that were constantly running over and, and conquering that area. And uh, when Herod came to power, um, he wanted to ingratiate himself and be remembered, of course, and so, uh, so he rebuilt the temple, but he rebuilt it in a fabulous, fabulous level. Um, huge, finely cut stones out of the finest materials, some of them as big as school buses. Um, gold adornments everywhere they could be. Um, just a magnificent building that was not just magnificent and gorgeous, but it was the center of the Jewish faith. People would come uh, from other countries. They would come from all around what was Palestine in those times and walk for miles and miles and miles, uh, if they could afford it annually, to worship at the temple. And I, I want you to just imagine what it would have been like. You can't really picture the scale from this model, but can you see the door in the wall? Uh, let's go keep back there, yeah. The door in the wall, um, if you can picture that little stairway going down, you standing right by that door, you'd go about 25% up the door. That's how big this place is. It's just huge and magnificent. And, um, and I want you to imagine, you know, being a peasant from out in the sticks every year coming into this temple. It'd be like uh, when I was a kid going to Disneyland. Did any of you do that when you were a kid, go to Disney World? I mean, you walk in the door and it's like, wow! Um, that's what it was like going to the temple every year going into this magnificent place and seeing the beauty and the holiness and knowing that the very presence of God uh, in the Holy of Holies was there. I mean, just this phenomenal place. Uh, and then uh, when you got old enough, you would bring your kids to the temple every year. And it was just this amazing experience to be there. So I want you to picture Jesus' disciples in our text for today um, coming into this temple court and seeing this fabulous presence of God structure this holy temple there, the center of their faith and life, and being so kind of awed by it once again, probably, you know, they've probably been there many, many times as kids and as adults, maybe brought their kids. And as they're standing there with Jesus, the Lord, in the presence of the temple in this holy place, some of them got caught up in the moment and said, Jesus, what a magnificent building, isn't it? And of course, Jesus said, yeah, it's just great. Love this temple. No, that's not what he said. That's what I kind of wish he would have said. Uh, but I, I want you to imagine what would have been going through their minds, these disciples who had been in this holy place their whole lives, uh, coming here and being so moved by it, um, when Jesus turned to them and said, you see this place, not one stone will be left upon another. And that's the next slide. Thank you, Kathy. I, I forced you to jump the gun. Um, when we, last time we visited uh, Jerusalem, they had gotten down to the level of the streets that Jesus walked on, and this is what's left of the temple. Um, some of us were kind of resting by sitting on the broken remains of the stones that the Romans pushed off that platform in 70 AD. Um, destroyed the whole thing. Everything. Um, and I, if I was a disciple of Jesus who heard that, um, I don't even know how I would begin to process it. Can you imagine what must have been going through their minds and their hearts as Jesus said, as they're staying in the midst of this holy and beautiful place, um, it's all gone. None of it. Not one stone left on another. And, uh, and I imagine their shock and their despair finally getting the courage to say, Lord, when is this going to happen? And what will be the sign? And in my mind, I'd be thinking, not in my lifetime, right? <laughs> it's going to be way distant, right? 
A little hope here, Jesus, a little help. Um, but then Jesus goes on to make it even worse. Uh, he doesn't comfort them and say, it'll be okay, you'll be all right. Um, he makes it even worse and says, yes, uh, this temple which seems so permanent and so eternal will be thrown down. And not only that, but everything you value, everything you know, everything you take for granted, everything that you count on in your life um, is also going to be shaken. It's going to be tested. It's going to be gone. Your families, some of them will turn against you. Nations will rise against nation. Um, everything you count on, everything you thought was permanent, it's all going to be gone. And um, I just can't imagine. Uh, how do you process something like that? It, it kind of sounds, as Jesus was talking about all of this, um, it's kind of had a familiar ring to it. Jesus even went so far as to say, the planet is going to turn against you. Even the earth. There will be plagues and earthquakes and famines. The nation that you know of. Everything's going to be changed. It's all going to be gone. And at that point, um, if we left it there, I kind of thought, what, what would that be like if, I, if, if church was like that? And every time you guys came, I would say, it's all going to be gone. It's all going to be taken away. That's the gospel of the Lord. Have a nice day. <laughs> but fortunately, um, Jesus didn't leave it there. He gave them three powerful, powerful promises in our text for today. And that's what I think we need to focus on. Um, the first one was, and we've almost turned this into a cliche, sadly. We don't take it seriously enough. Jesus promised them that in the midst of all of this difficult, difficult circumstance, he said, I will be with you. And like I said, we kind of think of that as a cliche, you know. We, we say, God be with you, or God go with you, or whatever. Um, Peace be with you, the Lord be with you. And we just kind of don't think about it. And I have to admit, um, when I run into very, very hard times, um, my training was as an engineer, and my first thought is not, um, I need God's help right now. My first thought is, I can fix this. I can do this. But in this text for today, Jesus didn't just say a cliche, it's okay, I'll be with you. He said, I will be with you to the point of saying, you don't even have to prepare your defense when you get hauled into court. I will give you wisdom. I will give you words. That's how much I'll be with you. I will give you what you need to get through this. Powerful, powerful promise that I don't think we turn to often enough. We don't take it seriously enough. It's so easy to let it flow off our tongues. God is with you. Um, but it's serious. And, and I hope that that becomes more my habit when I face a crisis that I can't understand or can't deal with, that my first, my knee-jerk reaction will be to remember this promise, Christ is with me and will give me what I need. I need to ask for God's help, and I will receive it. Jesus promised that. The second thing he promises his disciples and through them to us in our text for today um, is that they will discover who they really are. They will discover that, yes, um, temples are not eternal. Buildings are not eternal. Nations are not eternal. Relationships are not eternal. But you are. They will discover that they are the beloved children of God, and they are eternal. We are eternal. You are eternal. Jesus promises in our text for today that that's something we will come to know. Um, and the third promise he gives us uh, is much more challenging, but I think it's important. Jesus said it's through suffering that that will be revealed to us. Uh, I, a lot of times we want people to sugarcoat it. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be, it won't be so bad. 
But Jesus didn't say that. Um, he made it very, very clear that things are going to be hard. Um, you will go through difficult circumstances. Everything you thought uh, was permanent is going to be shaken and changed and turned upside down, and you will lose everything that you thought you had. Um, but he said, and by the way, um, that's the human condition. Whether we like it or not, that is true. There isn't a single one of you, nor me, who is going to leave this life with anything, right? We lose it all. We do. And Jesus warned his disciples, all this stuff you've been counting on, if you will allow it, um, God will use this suffering to pry us loose from our addiction to the temporary and to set our hearts on what is eternal. And it can go either way. God is not coercive. God isn't going to force it. In fact, too many times in my life and ministry I have seen people who go through a difficult time just become bitter and become angry and become hardened and even be driven away from God by difficult circumstances. But Jesus promises his disciples and he promises us through them that if we will allow it, God will actually use this suffering. I don't think God causes suffering, but God will use the suffering to pry us loose from the eternal and help us see and set our hearts on and become connected to what is eternal. Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our standing in Christ as the children of God, these eternal things, um, if we will allow it, God will use this suffering to set our hearts on those things and to be pried loose from the temporary. Um, so as hard as this is, it really is good news. And um, the difficulty is uh, it's not the path we want most of the time. It's not the thing we're looking for. Um, we want to find a way to avoid the hard times and the suffering and the difficulty. The phrase that Jesus uses that, uh, that is hard to translate into English, at the end he says, um, but through the suffering you will gain your souls. Did you notice that at the end of the text? He said, through the suffering you will gain your souls. Um, and too often throughout history that's been misinterpreted that somehow through suffering we are saved, uh, we are made right with God. And you know, you hear stories about the medieval monks whipping themselves, you know, because they think suffering is going to make me holy. Suffering is going to connect me with God. Total misinterpretation. What Jesus is saying is that if we will allow it um, through our suffering, God will reveal to us what is already ours in Christ. God will reveal to us that we are the children of God. God will reveal to us that we are eternal. God will reveal to us that no matter what our circumstances are, um, nothing that really matters will be hurt. Um, we are God's because of what God has done. And through our suffering, I think the word would be almost better translated. Our soul will be revealed to us. We will see it. We will own it. We will know it. Um, we will gain it. Um, so as challenging as this good news is, I thank God for it this morning. Because we all know, uh, as all you got to do is uh, look at the paper or look at the news, and you can see that uh, things these days aren't all that different, are they, from what Jesus was talking about? Nation against nation, earthquakes, famines, fires, um, all the stuff that we thought was permanent is changing right in front of our eyes. Sounds kind of familiar? Um, Jesus says, I am with you and I will give you what you need to get through it. And if we will allow it, through all of this, God will pry us loose from our addiction to this temporary stuff and help us to sink our hearts into what is eternal, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, and who we really are, the children of God in Christ. Amen.
Please stand for the hymn of the day. May the Lord be with you. Also with you. We have some cool things coming up. Uh, United in Thanksgiving. <clears throat> it's a please join for an interfaith celebration of gratitude at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Community. This is a free event with a reception immediately following with food from diverse families and faith traditions. Um, the St. John the Evangelist is the large Catholic church right across from Space Coast Stadium. And then this next announcement I know a little bit about, Sunday, November 27th at 3 o'clock, right here, the praise band, Disciple 13, is going to put on a concert. It is free, standing room only, doors open at 2.30, no cover charge. Um, it would be great to see everyone there. We're going to do some selections from uh, uh, some praise music that you may have heard and some other tunes that you may recognize. The season of Advent, small groups. We will be forming small groups to discuss an impactful devotional book to celebrate and draw closer to God. This 30-day journey includes devotions for the four weeks leading up to Christmas, 
based on the Advent themes of hope, love, joy, and peace. Please contact the pastor's assistant, Linda Herman, she's not here, if you are interested in joining a small group. The women's group Christmas Luncheon is December 5th at noon at Tuscany Grill. All the women are welcome. Information and sign up is in the Northex. Pastor Dave's retirement celebration. <laughs> Pastor Dave's retirement celebration. <laughs> Sunday, December 11th, after the 11 o'clock service, after the traditional service, please join us at Pastor Dave's retirement celebration reception to thank him for his commitment and dedication to Advent and service to God. Sign-ups for attendance and the luncheon contribution will be in the Northex. There is the easel. Oh, there's Linda. We were just talking about you. Um, there is an easel in the Northex close to the doors. Uh, if you'd like to write down you know, your name and, and anything you might like to bring, um, you don't have to bring anything. Just come on down. And then next Saturday, Don Rydeen's Celebration of Life service is here Saturday, November 19 at 1 o'clock. All are invited to the service, and reception is to follow in the fellowship hall. Please stand for God's blessing. Oh, Pastor Dave has one more. Sorry. My memory. Mm -mm -mm. I just want to do, uh, uh, thank Vicar Andy for his first time presiding. Good, good job. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Pastor Dave. And, uh, and Pastor Jeremy and I uh, wanted you to know he's going to be preaching next next week for the very first time. So, uh, so keep him in your prayers, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dave. You're welcome. Please stand for God's blessing. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace, and may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Amen.